everybody and welcome to the very first installment of Lesser Known History, Homeschool History Lessons, where every month we'll be diving into an event or a person um, that is um, important to history but you might not have ever heard of. So um, welcome. For our first homeschool history lesson, we're going to be discussing women's suffrage, um, specifically women's suffrage in the United States of America. So what is suffrage? Well, suffrage is the right to vote, especially in a political election. And for most of America's history, only men and then usually only white men were able to vote. Um, people believe that women and others just didn't have what it takes to vote. Either they weren't smart enough or they didn't have common sense. Or in the case of women, women would just vote with their fathers or their husbands. Um, and so their votes wouldn't count. Lots and lots of silly reasons. Um, but remember, a, a right isn't a right until it's granted to all, and the right to vote is a very important right. So this year, 2020, uh, marks the 100th anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. The 19th Amendment says that the rights of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied by the United States or by any state on account of gender. This amendment granted women the right to vote. The 19th Amendment was signed into law August 26, 1920, now known as Women's Equality Day. And fun fact, um, August 26th is my birthday, so um, this topic has always had a special place in my heart. Um, and um, so I figured it was a perfect time to do uh, a history lesson on this topic because we're, this is the 100th anniversary, yay! So here is a brief timeline of voting rights um, in the United States. Um, in 1776, the Declaration of Independence was signed, but only men who owned land and who were 21 years or older could vote, and voting laws are, were set by each state. In 1790, the Naturalization Law was passed, which allowed only free white immigrants to become citizens of the United States. Um, in, Senate, in 1848, in Seneca Falls, New York, the first Women's Rights Convention is held. Um, in 1866, the Civil Rights Act grants citizenship to native-born Americans, but it does not grant all citizens the right to vote. In 1868, the 14th Amendment grants citizenship to former slaves. In 1870, the 15th Amendment makes it illegal to deny, to deny anyone the right to vote based on race, but many states create uh, obstacles to prevent non-white people from voting. Uh, 1876, the Supreme Court rules that Native Americans are not citizens as defined by the 14th Amendment. Um, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act prohibits people of Chinese descent from becoming U.S. citizens. 1890, uh, Wyoming becomes a state and this is the first state to allow women to vote in state and local elections, but women are not allowed to vote in federal elections. 1890, the Indian Naturalization Act allows Native Americans to apply for citizenship. Um, they could basically apply for citizenship as immigrants, even though they were here the whole time. Um, in 1913, thousands of women gathered in Washington, D.C. for a parade and a march for suffrage. 1919, Native Americans who fought in World War I are granted citizenship. Um, and in 1920, the 19th Amendment it's passed allowing women the right to vote in all state and federal elections. And here is the brief timeline continued. Um, in 1922, the Supreme Court rules that people of Japanese heritage can't become citizens. 1923, the Supreme Court rules that people of Asian descent cannot become citizens. This includes people from um, India and other and other uh, countries in Asia. 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act gives citizenship to Native Americans, but many states create obstacles to prevent them from voting. 1943, the Magnuson Act repeals the Chinese Exclusion Act and allows people from Chinese descent to become citizens. 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act allows people of Asian descent to become citizens. 1962, New Mexico becomes the last state to grant Native Americans the right to vote. 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. gives his I Have a Dream speech to thousands of people during the March on Washington. 1964, the 24th Amendment abolishes poll taxes. 
1965, a voting rights campaign in Selma, Alabama, leads to the 54-mile Alabama Freedom March to the state capitol in Montgomery. 1965, the Voting Rights Act, Act forbid, forbids states from imposing the discriminatory restrictions on voting. 1971, the 26th Amendment lowers the voting age to 18. 1975, amendments to the Voting Rights Act requires ballots and voting instructions to be printed in language languages besides English. So non-English um, vote speaking uh, voters could, um, could now vote. 1993, the National Voter Registration Act makes registering to vote easier by allowing people to register at motor vehicle departments and other agencies. And uh, here are some fun um, suffrage cartoons. Um, this one is from 1891, um, and it's a woman um, with a very big hat, and there are lots of things in her hat. Um, she's got, it says, we are taxed, why not represented? We want our rights, we are as good as the men and better. All we ask is for the ballot, and we won't be happy until we get it. Um, it's votes for women. Um, and there are two men who are walking by, and they are thinking to themselves, I wonder if it's really becoming. And this is a fun play on words because um, they're saying, is it becoming, is it, you know, flattering for a woman to be a suffragette to want to vote, and it's also them wondering if the right to vote is actually coming. Is it becoming? So I thought this one was really fun. And here's another really fun um, suffragette cartoon, and this one is from 1909, and it shows a woman um, looking over a fence, and this one says women's sphere, and um, the text is really small, but what it says underneath is women, woman devotes her time to gossip and clothes because she has nothing else to talk about. And then underneath it shows a woman going to cast her vote, pushing a baby carrier, and it says, give her broader interest and she will cease to be vain and frivolous. It's not exactly the most <laughs> flattering depiction of women, but I thought it was a pretty fun one that showed women um, voting with pushing babies and baby carriage carriages. Along with the uh, many suffrage cartoons that uh, were around at the time. There were also many suffrage songs, and one of my favorite ones that I found is from 1916, and it's called She's Good Enough to Be Your Baby's Mother, and She's Good Enough to Vote with You. Um, and I highly recommend um, looking this one up online. Uh, you can find several clips, on, several um, versions of the song on YouTube, but the lyrics basically go, um, a woman's good enough to, to, kiss your boo-boos when you're when you're young to raise you she's good enough to give you all these famous men at the time woodrow wilson teddy roosevelt um and and then it says and she's she's good enough to be your baby's mother and she's good enough to vote with you it's a really great song and um i think it's probably one of the best suffragette songs that have, that came out during that time so what I want to talk about now is the um, 1913 uh, women's suffrage procession that happened um, in Washington, D.C. So on March 3rd, 1913, thousands of women gathered in Washington, D.C. for a parade and a march for suffrage. Even though women had been fighting hard for suffrage for over 60 years, this was the first really major national event for the movement because it was in Washington, D.C. There had been other parades um, in New York and other places, but this was a really big one because it was in Washington, D.C. Um, so at the very front of the procession was riding a right horse was lawyer and activist Inez Milholland, and she led over 5,000 suffragettes up Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, and you'll see her in just a minute. And there you'll see her um, um, riding her white horse, wearing a crown and a cape and looking very much like Wonder Woman. Um, I think Wonder Woman, who's probably a little bit inspired by her, um, is in Esmo Holland. And then over on the other side, you'll see um, another pro other processions of women mar uh, marching um, on horseback. And then in the in the corner, in the bottom corner, you'll see a bunch of women dressed in white. And these were the homemakers who were marching in at the parade. Um, uh, there's a lot of really great pictures online, um, but I just wanted to post a few of them here for you to look at. So um, the women who organized the parade decided to have the parade one day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. And this was really smart because that meant a ton of people were in town for the inauguration. 
Now, um, some people weren't super um, happy about the parade, and there was a lot of um, drunken men and others who um, tripped and attacked a lot of the women marching in the parade. Um, there were, were police, but a lot of them didn't really um, try to stop it, and so a lot of women um, uh, were were injured. Um, hundreds of women actually had to be hospitalized for injuries. But even though hundreds of women were injured, um, that didn't mean that the parade stopped or the women gave up. They finished the parade, and um, the 1913 parade is often credited by historians for giving the suffrage movement a new wave of inspiration and purpose. And um, it was seven years after this that the 19th Amendment would be passed. And this is one of the things that is credited with giving the suffrage movement that final push. So it's a very important moment in uh, the, the history of suffrage. So now I want to talk about a really great story um, in the history of suffrage. Um, and it's all about how one vote matters. So the 19th Amendment came down to about one vote. Um, 35 states had voted yes to women's suffrage, but the country would need 36 states to vote yes for it to become a law. And it all came down to one state, it all came down to Tennessee, because Tennessee was the last state to vote. And if Tennessee voted yes, women would be able to vote in every state. And if Tennessee voted no, things would stay the same and women could only vote in certain states. So it's a pretty big deal. And a man named Harry Byrne, he was, was a young lawmaker in Tennessee at the time, and he had voted against women's suffrage before, and most of the people who had elected Harry were against women's suffrage. Um, and Harry went to cast his vote. He was wearing a red rose on his jacket, and this was a symbol that he was against women's suffrage. Everyone who wore a red rose on their jacket um, voted against women's suffrage. But then Harry surprised everyone by voting yes instead. Um, and people were shocked. They couldn't understand it. So why did Harry change his mind and vote yes? Well, Harry's mother had written him a letter and he received it that morning. And in the letter, his mother told him to vote for suffrage and to, quote, be a good boy. And Harry had this letter in his pocket when he went to cast his vote. Now, Harry said afterwards that, um, I know that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow. He knew that the people who voted for him would not be happy that he voted for suffrage, and he knew that he would probably not get reelected because he voted yes. But Harry said that he was following his conscience, and that his conscience had told him that women were people, and that they deserved the right to vote. Harry stood up for what he believed in, even though he knew it would make people angry and that it would probably cost him his job. Harry knew that one vote matters, and Harry's mother, Feb Byrne, knew that one voice matters. And in the end, Harry ended up getting reelected after all. So now I'd like to talk about some famous suffragettes that you've probably heard about or learned about in school. One of the most famous suffragettes um, is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She was born November 12, 1815, and she died October 26, 1902. Um, here's one of her quotes that I really love. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. Um, Elizabeth was born the daughter of a lawyer. Her uh, father wanted her to be educated and brave, and he taught, he taught her um, a lot about the law. Um, now, Elizabeth was very against slavery, and in 1840, she attended a world anti-slavery convention, but women were banned from participating in the convention. Um, and this this upset Elizabeth and a lot of the other women, but it didn't let um, them didn't stop them from talking amongst themselves and sharing their opinions with each other. Uh, in 1848, Elizabeth, who was then a young mother, and her friends decided to hold a meeting about women's rights in Seneca Falls, New York. 300 women and men attended, and these were some of the very first American suffragettes. Um, at this Women's Rights Convention in 1848, Elizabeth and others wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, which is a document detailing the social and political rights that women felt they deserved. And the quote that I just um, mentioned from her um, is from that document. And now uh, for probably the most famous suffragette, um, Susan B. Anthony, who um, you may have learned about in school. 
Um, she was born February 15th, 1820, and died March 13th, 1906. Um, here's a great quote from her. No man is good enough to govern any woman without her consent. Um, Susan was born into a family of Quakers, and Quakers is a religion that believes that men and women have equal abilities. In 1851, Susan met Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and the two started a friendship that would last for over 50 years. In 1872, Susan voted in the presidential election in Rochester, New York, even though it was illegal at that time for women to vote. Um, Susan knew this, but she wanted to bring the suffrage right to the courts, and she knew she would get press because of it. Um, Susan was arrested, found guilty, and was fined $100. And this was $100 in, 19, in 1872, so that's a lot of money. Susan refused to pay the fine, but the judge didn't put her in jail. The judge didn't want Susan to go to a higher court of law, and he didn't want the, um, this to gain more attention. Um, in 1878... She and other women first proposed an amendment to the Constitution. It would become known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment. Susan died 14 years before this amendment would pass, but Susan never stopped fighting for the vote, and she never gave up hope. Now that we've discussed some suffragettes that are very famous and you've probably heard of, I want to now spend the rest of this time talking about suffragettes you should know but you probably haven't heard about. And this is where the lesser known history part of the lesser known history lesson comes into play. So the first suffragette that you should know about is Ida B. Wells. She was born July 16th, 1862 and died March 25th, 1931. Um, here's a great quote from her. With no sacredness of the ballot, there can be no sacredness of human life itself. Uh, Ida was born a slave. Um, but at six months old, she and her family were freed by the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation. Ida's parents died when she was 16, and she had to take care of her five younger siblings. Um, in 1884, she was on a train to Nashville, Tennessee. She had purchased a first-class ticket, but trains were segregated at this time, and this meant that white and black people couldn't ride in the same train car. Ida was told to ride in a different car. Ida refused to move because she had paid for her first-class ticket, and she was going to stay in first class. But the conductor and other passengers dragged her off the train, ripping her dress and getting her all bruised and bloody. Ida ended up suing the railroad, and she, and she ended up winning. Now, even though ultimately the ruling was overturned, her bravery and did inspire others to fight against oppression. Um, Ida founded the Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago in 1913 to organize African-American women to fight for suffrage. Um, the Alpha Suffrage Club wanted to march in the 1913 suffrage parade, but organizers of the parade wanted the club to march in the back because they weren't white. Um, back, uh, at that time, um, the suffrage movement was also quite segregated. Um, but as the parade started, Ida came out of the crowd and marched in line towards the front of the parade, and no one stopped her or dragged her away this time. She was a very, um, very brave woman, and she fought very hard against oppression and for women's rights. And she's someone you definitely should know. So the second suffragette you should know about is Mary Church Terrell. She was born September 23rd, 1863 and died July 24th, 1954. Here's a great quote from her. And so lifting as we climb, onward and upward we go, struggling and striving and hoping that the buds and blossoms of our desires will burst into glorious fruition ere long. She was talking about women winning, winning the right to vote. Um, Mary attended uh, boarding schools as a child, and these schools uh, allowed both white and African-American children to attend. And Mary was often bullied at school by white children because of the color of her skin. Uh, but Mary ended up um, really excelling in school, and she ended up going to college. And she was one of the very first African-American women to graduate from college. Um, Mary believed that education was the most important thing, so she became a teacher, and she even served on Washington, D.C.'s Board of Education and was the first African-American woman to do so. Uh, Mary met Susan B. Anthony in 1898 and became a suffragette. Uh, Mary fought hard in the South for suffrage for African-American women. In 1896, she helped found the National Association of Colored Women, and Mary and her daughter um, even protested outside the White House for women's suffrage. Uh, Mary uh, did uh, worked very hard for women's suffrage and for women's rights and for African American women in general, and she is one of the um, great suffragettes, um, and everyone should know her name. 
The next suffragette you should know about is Fanny Barrier Williams. She was born February 12, 1855 and died March 4, 1944. Here's a great quote from her from one of her speech she gave about um, women's rights. I cannot be counted for my full value, be that much or little. I dare not cease to hope and aspire and believe in human love and justice, but progress is painful and my faith is often strained to the breaking point. She's specifically talking about African-American women's rights. Um, Fanny was born to two free African-Americans in Brockport, New York. Fanny was the first African-American to earn a college degree at Brockport Normal School. Fanny tried to enroll in a school of fine arts to study painting, but was denied because of the color of her skin. Um, Fanny was accepted at the New England Conservatory of Music, but was asked to withdraw from the school because her fellow white classmates didn't want her studying there and they refused to leave and they and they threatened to leave the school unless she stopped attending. This inspired Fanny to become an activist. Fanny and her husband moved to Chicago and she became active in fighting for women's suffrage. And along with Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell, who we just learned about, she helped found the National League of Colored Women in 1896. Uh, Fanny fought so hard for women's suffrage, in fact, that she was the only African-American asked to give a eulogy at Susan B. Anthony's funeral. Um, she um, was uh, a very important suffragette, and she um, did a lot for the cause of women's suffrage. And um, I hope more and more people um, will, uh, will learn about her in the future. So the next woman I want to talk about who is uh, very important in uh, women's suffrage what, um, is Zitkala Sa. Uh, she was born February 22nd, 1876 and died January 26th, 1938. Here's a great quote from her. There is no great, there is no small in the mind that causeth all. Um, Zitkala Sa, which means red bird, was born on the Yankton Indian Reservation in South Dakota. She lived on the reservation until she was eight. Um, then she was recruited to attend a Quaker school by Quaker missionaries. Um, at the school, she was forced to cut her long hair and a lot of her heritage was stripped away. But she did learn to play the violin at school and she, she developed a deep love of music. Uh, she studied violin and she even taught music as an adult. Um, she, Kalesa was also a writer. She wrote collections of Native American legends, among many other things. Um, in the 1920s, she fought very hard for women's rights. She also fought very hard for civil rights for Native Americans. Um, she fought hard for the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act, which gave Native Americans the right to vote in the United States. But she also fought very hard uh, uh, in the 1920s for the 19th Amendment, even though she knew that if it was um, passed, she would not be allowed to vote because she was a Native American. Um, there's a lot of really great um, books about her and information about her out there. So I highly encourage you to learn more about her because she was a really fantastic woman. The next woman I would like to talk about is Mabel Ping Hua Lee. Um, she was very um, active in the women's suffrage movement. She was born uh, roughly around 1895. It's really hard to pinpoint exactly when. Uh, and she died in 1966. Um, she was born in China. And she moved to the U.S. in 1905 to join her father. Her father was a Christian mission, missionary. And now Mabel's family were among very few Chinese immigrants who were allowed in the United States at that time because of certain acts that had been passed. Um, but they were allowed in because her father was a missionary. Uh, she went to college and she even earned a Ph.D. in economics from Columbia University. Um, she was very passionate about women's rights and she joined the suffrage movement. She even rode on horseback in the 1912 New York City Parade in support of women's suffrage. Um, because Mabel was a Chinese immigrant, she could not vote even after 1920 because of the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. And even though she knew she would not get to vote, even if the 19th Amendment passed, she still fought very hard for women, women's rights. Um, and one of the great quotes from her is, we all believe in the idea of democracy, women's suffrage, or the feminist movement of which women's suffrage is a fourth part, is the application of democracy to women. Um, she was even written up in the New York Tribune um, about the fact that she wants to vote. Um, it says Chinese girl wants to vote underneath her picture. And it says that she is ready to enter um, the barnyard to write in the suffrage parade. Um, and uh, she was a really fantastic woman. And there's a, um, more and more information about her coming out, but there's not too much out there. But I, she was uh, really important and fought very hard 
uh, for women's, women's suffrage. So I highly encourage you to look her up and learn more about her. And the last woman I want to talk about um, who was very important in the suffrage cause was Adelina Otero Warren. Uh, she was born October 23rd, 1881 and died January 23rd, 1965. And one great quote from her is, I will take a stand and a firm one whenever necessary. Um, she was born into a Hispano family in what would become the state of New Mexico, um, which is one of the reasons I decided to, um, to talk about her as I'm originally from New Mexico and I had never ever heard of her. So I figured a lot of other people hadn't either. Um, now, her family owned lots of land in New Mexico. They owned a lot of land around Albuquerque, the Albuquerque area, which is um, in the northern part of New Mexico. Um, and she was very brave and tough as a child, and she loved riding horses and helping out on her family's ranch. Um, she attended boarding school and eventually became a teacher. Now, in the western states, women often had more rights than they did in the eastern states. But in 1912, when New Mexico became a state, it denied women the right to vote. Um, Adelina was, was very upset by this, and she began to fight for women's suffrage. Um, but there was no women's suffrage organization in New Mexico at that time, so Adelina had to start one herself. Um, with the help of Alice Paul, another famous suffragette. In 1922, Adelina won the Republican nomination for a seat on the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, she was the very first Hispanic woman to run for national office. But um, when it was revealed that Adelina was divorced and not a widow, as she had claimed, she lost the election. She had actually got divorced. Um, and at that time, it was a very scandalous thing for a woman to be divorced. So instead of saying that she was divorced, she said she was a widow. And when that information came out, she lost the election. Um, she was a very cool woman, and she fought really, really hard for women's suffrage. And she did a lot for women's suffrage in New Mexico. And um, I really hope more and more people learn about her because I never heard of her, and I'm from New Mexico. So I'm betting a lot of other people hadn't heard of her either. So um she was yet another really, really cool, important woman in the suffrage movement, and I hope more and more people will, learn, will be learning about her in the future. So now that we've learned a lot about women's suffrage, are you interested in learning more? Stay tuned. Um, if you want to learn more about women's suffrage, I highly recommend the Library of Congress is uh, Shall Not Be Denied exhibit. Um, it's uh, Shall Not Be Denied, Women Fight for the Vote, um, and it is an exhibit that um, started in, the Library of Congress started in 19, uh, in last year, in 2019, um, and it was supposed to run through part of this year, but they will probably end up extending it because a lot of things have shut down because of the pandemic, but hopefully they will extend it into next year um, because it is a really fantastic exhibit. Now here is the website um, for you to go to to um, go look at the exhibit for yourself. This exhibit explores the stories of dozens of diverse women who shaped the suffrage movement and who made history. This exhibit is closed right now. The actual physical exhibit is closed to the public, but you can access everything online, including uh, short little brief uh, tours and all of the documents have been digitized. So there's a ton of things to look for. There's images, music, cartoons, uh, songs, um, there's so many things, including um, a, a little brief video of a suffragettes meeting with um, Teddy Roosevelt, um, which is pretty interesting to watch. Now here is um, a little screen capture of the, uh, the Shall Not Be Denied exhibit. You'll see it's broken up into um, um, different categories, um, building the movement, new tactics for a generation, the struggle um, when right around when women won the victory and um, the one that I really highly recommend is the one more to the movement if you go to the website and you go to explore the exhibit and you click on more to the movement it'll show you a bunch of really amazing women um, um, who do not get talked about a lot um, some of the women that we talked about today and, and a bunch of other women that I did not get a chance to talk about today, so I highly recommend going to this website and um, going to explore the exhibit and clicking on more to the movement. Even if that's all you, uh, even if that's all you have time to do, I highly re recommend doing it. Another um, collection that I highly recommend you um, 
checking out is the Black Women's Suffrage Collection. Um, here's the website below. Um, uh, it, the Digital Public Library of America created this collection, and it's a collection of women who played a significant leadership roles leading up to and during the women's suffrage movement and beyond, but whose stories and contributions are not widely known. Um, there's a ton of great women on there, including some women we learned about um, in this video, like Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell. So I highly recommend um, visiting that website and exploring that collection. And here is a screen capture of the Black Women's Suffrage collection. You'll see um, it says Black Women's Suffrage, thousands of artifacts, thousands of stories. You're able to search the collection. It has uh, pictures. It has it has information. It is, it is a really fantastic um, uh, website. And um, the um, the images and, and, and everything they put together is really fantastic. So um, if you have time, please check that, that website out. Um, and now I'd like to recommend some books and other things if you'd like to learn more about women's suffrage. Here's some of the books that um, books and other other things that I used when I was researching this um, this lesson. And I highly recommend a lot of these books. One of um, like Bold and Brave, Ten Heroes Who Won Women the Right to Vote. It's really a fantastic book. Equality's Call, The Story of Voting Rights in America. That's where I got the um, A Right's Not a Right Till It's Granted to All. It's a fantastic little book. Um, it's very short. Um, Give Us the Vote, Over 200 Years of Fighting for the Ballot is another really great one. It goes over a lot of uh, really important details that are often glossed over. So I highly recommend those books. Uh, here are some more books I highly recommend. History Smashers, Women's Right to Vote, talks a lot about um, things you probably didn't know about women's suffrage. Um, how Women Run the Right to Vote is about Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, and their big idea. So it's a lot of suffragettes, including some of the ones we learned about today. Um, it's a really, really cute book, and the illustrations are great. And the book I really highly recommend is Lifting as We Climb, which is the Mary Church Terrell quote, Black Woman's Battle for the Ballot Box by Yvette Dion. Um, it's actually the book that inspired me to um, create this lesson. Um, it is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I highly recommend that one. So here are a few more books. Um, Redbird Sings is a great uh, book about Sikala Sa, kind of told from her memoirs. If you'd like to learn more about her, that's a great book. Um, the Voice That Won the Vote, How Woman, Woman's Words Made History by Eliza Boxer is a really fantastic little picture book. It's It tells the story that we learned early about Harry Byrne and um, how his mother's letter in his pocket how, um, changed his his vote and uh, ended up passing the 19th amendment so i highly recommend that one and then vote woman's fight for the access to the ballot box is another really good one it's some really great information in there so another few books i uh, highly recommend okay and last but not least um, um women win the vote 19 for the 19th amendment talks about 19 amazing women um, who fought for women's suffrage um, i got a ton of the information for this lesson out of this book um, I highly recommend it. The information in it is great and the illustrations are fantastic. Um, I also highly recommend the PBS American Experience documentary, The Vote. Um, 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 it is also available at the PBS website. You can watch it for free there. I put the link below. Um, and I also highly recommend if you want to learn more about Sit Kala Sa, trail, uh, um, you can go to this PBS video. I put the link there under American Masters. It's just a quick 10 minute video about her and her life and it's really fantastic. Um, so here's those are the books and websites I recommend. Um, all of the books you can get um, if you're in the Treasure Valley in Idaho. Um, they're all in the in the Treasure Valley library system so you can put any of them on hold and pick them up at any library and if you're outside of Idaho I highly recommend checking with your local library to see if any of these are available. Um, well, I'm betting a lot of them will be since it is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. I hope you really enjoyed this, this lesson. Um, I really enjoyed making it, um, and I will see you next month for another um, lesser-known history homeschool history lesson. Bye!